IR would be Douglas Forsyth um, from Boltier Farm. The history of the farm taken over from my father, we had probably in the region of 130 cows. So once we started to progress, we kind of moved up towards 350 without too much investment really, just by kind of maximising what was already here. But it, it did become quite problematic that it was not fit for purpose. So then we decided to move on. Uh, so we built a new dairy to accommodate 500. But we also still had the old dairy, which was quite useful for dry cows and whatever. So we probably done that and settled with that for about another eight years. Then we decided to move on again, just kind of economics or scale of economy. So we put another building up for another 320 cows. That then allows us to milk about 850 cows actually milking, still with the dry cow accommodation. So we're probably kitted out now for the region of 1,000 cows. But it seems to work now fairly well at about 850 milking. That now probably gives us around 15 full tanker loads per fortnight, which is probably optimum for the capacity of the farm and where we want to be. So that's basically summarising the dairy. But as the dairy got bigger, the requirement for power and energy obviously came with it. So when we moved to the 500 cow dairy and installed a, a rotary parlour, Everything then needed to be three phase to operate. So the farm was only on a single phase, maybe 50 kilowatt supply. So really it wasn't capable of running the bigger equipment. So we decided at the early stage, we ran the dairy on a generator, which we probably done for about maybe five years or maybe four years, I suppose. But it was becoming expensive for fuel and maintenance and whatever. So we looked at how it was best to get a three-phase supply. And we did have a three-phase supply on our own boundary within maybe 1,200 metres. So to justify the expense, we looked at options that we could have, which initially was to have wind turbines, which would have been maybe trouble-free or less hassle to operate but then they were not 24 seven power. Then planning turned them down anyway. So we looked at sort of plan B. The best thing looked to be an anaerobic digester. So that was put into action probably in around 2013, by which time the new dairy had run for three years. So it would have been before we actually got the digester to operate properly, it would have been about 2014 and at that point it started off as 250 kilowatts. The changes we needed to make to make the thing work properly and you know even feed properly and heat it properly, mix it properly, the cost was quite substantial. So we decided to increase the capacity to justify the expense. So the capacity was increased to 500 and Probably since they know it has run pretty well, but you know it it does occasionally have the odd problems come along. But like anything else, experience to operate it is a great thing. So once that had sort of settled and went fairly well, it was never a perfect solution to anaerobic digestion. So we decided to move it on again, and we've currently just built a new digester system which will now handle around 1200 kilowatts but it may well run separate from the existing one but at least in the event of anything happening to the older one we've got contingency that we can still produce gas to run the generators on the original. So off the new one it's got the option either to run for electric production into the grid Laterally there we've upgraded our grid capacity to 900 kilowatts of export. So in combination of the 900 export, the full site load now would probably be, it can be up to maybe 500 to 550 kilowatts. Probably as far as electric goes now, it's turned out rather well. But 
off the new AD plant, because there's probably no tariff now on the electric, we're now looking at doing it as a, a gas to grid plant. So we're looking into that currently where it'll be classed as a virtual gas to grid plant, whereas the power from the other one can be used to operate the equipment, which will clean biogas into biomethane. And it's quite power demanding to do that operation. So for one to be paid a tariff to produce the power to operate the other one looks quite a logical thing to do. And on that basis, the biogas from the new one can be cleaned into biomethane, which will then be put in under high pressure into like tube tanker trailers. And from there we can take it to a, a network that would be on the highest tariff you can get. And then it will be injected into the grid. So on that basis, the new digester can create currently with low gas price, about 3.6 million per year on the gas value coming from the new tank that's just been complete. So that's probably currently what would be underway and probably will happen. So out with that, in the early days when we had more power, we then had the luxury we had more power than we needed. In them days, power to the grid was probably only worth around 5p a kilowatt. So we started to look at other venues that might be more lucrative for the power. So a fairly basic thing initially was to put in a 1,000 kilowatt biomass boiler. That operated fairly well. That would be used mainly to dry like digestate and wood chip. The digestate being dried to be used as animal bedding. So then we still had quite an amount of power available. So it seemed at that time that ground source heat pumps seemed to be the thing but were only really of any use if you had like a, a realistic power supply at a realistic cost. So we put in one of them systems, which is mainly used to dry animal feed, or some of the animal feed can be dried for bedding. Then it can be bedded in the panes for the cattle to lie on, and then it can be mucked out and dumped back in the digester for food in combination with the muck. So all in all, they've fairly tied in pretty well that now lets the farm have free energy. We've got an uplift in animal bedding and we've also got an uplift in the, the feed for the cows and also the digester. So probably has been a fairly significant investment, but due to tariffs and whatever, it's probably turned out to be a fairly good move for the business in general. So. Probably as far as that goes, the only other thing we can now do is maybe consider putting in solar panels. That just means with the event of having them, it'll allow more power to be exported to the grid. And that's only because we've got quite a high grid capacity for export. So not at the moment, but we may well look to that in the future just to complete the renewable package. So all in all, it's certainly, yeah, it's had its challenges, but, you know, probably well worth it uh, financially wise in the long run. And, you know, it's, we've came through a spell in COVID when power's been exceptionally high. So we never had any impact on huge power bills, but we did have a fairly high impact on excess energy to the grid, which was very valuable. So, like any walk of life, there is volatility there, but at least you've got the security of the tariff, which for better or worse will always be consistent. But I suppose out with that, we do actually have a wind turbine as well, but we ended up having to purchase a piece of land out with the area, and then we put our own turbine there. So that was the only way to have one of them, as the local planners were not ever in favour. So. It was interesting to have that, but it's very obvious that the output from a wind turbine is non-comparable to an anaerobic digester. For example, a wind turbine power factor is probably lucky to make 25%, whereas an anaerobic digester will be nearer 100%. So it's quite an interesting thing to see the difference between them, but Although we were unsure a bit about the anaerobic digester initially, it's probably the best thing we've ever done. 
So it's quite a quite a luxury in the background to stabilise income for the farm because milk's quite a volatile product to be working with, which can be very good or it can be quite quite a tight supply. I would say advice in the early days for anaerobic anaerobic digestion was non-existent. Hence the reason initially that plant did not operate at all. The people involved probably knew less about it than me. So, you know, that sort of forced me, we'd already invested quite heavily in it. So, I mean, we didn't really want to stand the loss. So that sort of inspired me to find out a lot more than I ever thought I would need to about how it actually operated and what was needed to make it operate at full capacity. So maybe not all bad news because, I mean, now I would think I would probably know more about it than most of them have anything to do with, hence the reason the capacity factor is now so high. And it probably is not as complicated as you would have initially thought, but, I mean, the rest things need to be right, which if you didn't know in the early days, there's no other way it would have worked. So I suppose, generally speaking, there'll be a lot of them in the country that have probably failed. Maybe not just for the average farmer, unless he was getting quite good um, backup and help to be able to make it operate. I suppose that's just part of the challenge, really. But in the early days, you were not to know that. It just looked as though it was going to be a simple stick it in, walk away, and it was fine. But sadly not. Nevertheless, because we've had it working so well, it certainly gives me confidence to move on and make one considerably bigger and obviously a lot more functional. And anything that would have went wrong with the old one cannot go wrong with the new one. So it's moved on very much so that, you know, the ease of operation will be non-comparable. I think technology certainly now would very much have moved on a lot. Um, probably more common now, which has allowed for, you know, more, more experience to be gained. And from there, it definitely has moved on. Things will be more reliable, uh, probably more efficient. So it definitely has came a long way in 10 years. Farming, where you've got, you know, requirement for energy, you know, they both work very well hand in hand because obviously the farm needs the power but the digester also does well on the cow slurry. And in particular, the cow slurry would be regenerating bacteria. And I mean, without them bacteria being live and active, you would only have problems. And probably it's a well-known fact that a farm-based anaerobic digesters will be a much more stable operation than like waste food, for example. And it's purely only because the cow slurry it's very much a stabiliser for the biology and that keeps everything active and that's probably why once you've mastered it, it works so well. Yeah, well, all the electricity now produced, it, it would actually now get what they call a green certificate. So at the last auction, the per kilowatt, um, the green certificate, which is called a rego, it, uh, the best auction has came in at around 2.1p a kilowatt. That's a completely new bonus that was never there before. And on the same foot in there, there's now a green gas certificate, which would actually then pay you for producing biomethane. So you'll have the tariff on the gas, then you'll have the gas to sell, and then you'll also have the green gas certificate. So that's why probably the gas is much more lucrative than the electricity, especially now, currently. I mean, electricity could have went from like maybe 60 pence or more in the midst of COVID. Probably today it's probably only worth 6 or 7p. So if you were only producing power to export, you would nearly be negative in earning potential. Whereas now they seem to be driving for gas you know, which is biomethane being very similar to LNG, which is what's in the main gas network. So it would certainly seem to be the one at the moment where the requirement would lie. When we built this new plant initially, because it was going to be electric and thought the price would probably stabilise about maybe 15 to 20p, 
he probably was still okay. It probably is still okay because its capacity allows it to run more on like cheaper products like silage and cow slurry. Whereas because you've got more capacity and volume, you can be able to use lower value products, which are cheaper. So it still would work better from that angle. But at that time, we didn't realize that you could get the gas to grid tariff unless you were actually on a main gas line. So it's very much a new concept that you can produce the gas and then transport it by road to take it where you would inject to the grid. And in actual fact, you can probably choose where is the most lucrative place to take it, i.e. the one that would pay the most for the gas. So, yeah, I would say that's quite an interesting new aspect to renewables for sure. But that's maybe slightly different from the average farm requirement because, I mean, the cost of doing that is substantial. You know, you're probably looking at a minimum £5 million investment to get started at any level that would be possible to be viable in scale. Whereas on the other hand, if you were doing small scale electric generation, the cost of that would be probably more normalized for a, a standard farm.